section 2.4. Uh, as you can see here, we're going to be talking about perfect sets and connected sets. This is the last section of chapter 2 of basic topology. And this section really just consists of two theorems uh, and a really popular set in the mathematical community known as a Cantor set, uh, named after the mathematician George Cantor. So, uh, with the corollary, and this corollary is more like a, I suppose, a lemma we're going to use, but we had previously gone over it or mentioned it in a previous lecture. And it was a corollary of a theorem. And this corollary says that if K sub N is a sequence of non-empty compact sets such that they're nested, then the intersection of infinitely many of those sets is not empty. So we're going to be using that. The reason and when we're going to use it is because we're going to prove that a non-empty perfect set in RK and Euclidean spaces is uncountable. Okay, so this theorem isn't, uh, I suppose, obvious. We will have to go slowly, see what each step means. So first, we note that since P has limit points, P must be infinite. Why is that? Well, because P is perfect, right? And all the points in a perfect set are limit points. And since P has limit points, well, by definition of limit points, P must be infinite. Now suppose P is countable. So we're going to arrive at a contradiction and denote the points not oof of, so let me erase right here. Since P is countable, denote the points of P as X1, X2, X3, so on and so forth. So we can arrange them in a list since they are countable. Well, now we're going to construct a sequence of neighborhoods V sub N as follows. So this is how we're going to construct it. We're going to let V1 be a neighborhood of X1. All right, so X1, let's say is right here, is going to be a neighborhood of v1 so v1 consists of all uh, y in rk such that y is less than x1 the closure of v1 is a set all, uh, of all y's such that y minus x1 is less than or equal to r so this is just saying pretty much let me draw a better picture this is the neighborhood of v1 uh, the closure would be all the points inside and now with it uh, we kind of like close that off okay so suppose vn has been constructed so that vn intersection with p is not empty so then since every point of p is a limit point of p there is a neighborhood vn plus one such that these three properties hold. And let me draw a better picture to, to see so we can see what's going on with this. So I'm going to do like a, I suppose, intervals to kind of help us see. But um, this is just in a metric space or in actually in Euclidean space. But I'm going to do it like on the real line just so we can see what's happening. So this is x1. And this is, let's say, this is the neighborhood of x1. Right, so now we choose a x2, right? That's also in the interior, but now we're going to exclude. So we're going to have this here, but we're going to exclude x1. So this is x2. So we have these three properties. The closure of Vn plus 1 is contained in Vn. We can see green, one, green plus 1 in this case is contained in Vn. Also, Xn is not contained in the closure of the next one. So as you can see here, uh, in this case, X1 is not contained 
in the closure of Vn plus 1. And finally, uh, the intersection of the green with uh, just like, a, let's say this is P. Um, I don't know, let's just say this is P, like the whole set. Uh, the intersection is not empty. So we got that too. So we have these three properties and this is how we're constructing it. So for example, if we were to construct another neighborhood, uh, X3, we would choose this here and we would exclude X2. All right, so that's how we're constructing these neighborhoods. So by three, by property three, I'm going to still underline them so we can follow, but I'm just going to color code them and make sure they don't get in the way. Blue, let's do this one red and we'll do this one blue. Okay, so by three here, VN1 satisfy our induction hypothesis. And we can just uh, keep doing this uh, this process where we're excluding that uh, the point X uh, N. So we're going to let K N or put K N be the intersection of all these uh, new sets, these neighborhoods V, the closure of VN intersection with P. So K N is basically the sequence that's happening here of the nested uh, neighborhoods, right? And we know it's nested because of our green property, our first property. Well, since the closure of VN is closed and bounded, VN, as we saw the Heine-Borel theorem uh, last lecture, the closure of VN is compact. Well, since Xn is not in the next neighborhood, right? Because every neighborhood we're excluding the next point. So Xn can be in Xn plus one. Well, then no point of P lies. If we take this to infinity, we're, I mean, going to exclude all Xn's, right? So there will be no point of P that lies in this intersection. But Kn is in P, right? So this implies that this intersection is indeed empty. Can you see where this contradiction is going to happen now? Should be fairly obvious now. Kn is not empty by property three, right? Property three guarantees that that intersection is not empty. And we have a, the neighborhoods are nested. Well, this contradicts the corollary above, right? If we have all these nested compact sequence our sets, in this case neighborhoods, well then the intersection of infinitely many is not empty. But wait a minute, we had a claim that it's it was empty here. Ah, that's where we thus have our contradiction. So this cannot hold. Uh, suppose P is countable, that cannot hold because it does lead us to a contradiction. So what can we say? We say that uh, if P is a subset, a perfect non-empty subset in RK, well then P is uncountable. Okay, now we move on to our famous set. Oh, sorry, there's actually a corollary to this that I did not let you, uh, I'm not letting you see because of all this writing. So let me just erase this. And we have that, the corollary, that's just an example basically of this theorem, concrete or not a concrete example, but less general example. Every interval closed A, B is uncountable. So in particular, the set of all real numbers is uncountable. Okay, so the definition of our set, this is how the set is defined and constructed, the Cantor set. So a set which we're uh, 
now going to construct shows that there exists perfect set in R1, but contains no segment, meaning like no interval. It's a perfect set with no interval. The way we're going to do this, we're going to let E1 be the interval 0, 1, right? So just a closed interval 0, 1 on the real line. We're going to remove the segment, the open interval from uh, 1 third to 2 thirds, right? So if we had, if this was 0, 1, 0, oh. 1, we're going to remove the middle third. So let's say right here. Oh my gosh. Give me one second. We are going to remove this middle third. Uh, I think that should look good enough. Uh, and then here, because we removed an open set, this remains closed, right? So as it says over here, this is E1. So this is the closed, this was E0. This is now E1, which consists of the union of these two closed intervals, zero to one third, so this is one third and then two thirds to one. Next, we're going to remove the, uh, what's in the middle of those two, right? So if we remove the middle of those two, the middle third, what would that look like? Give me one second. Um, it would look something like this. And now it would be E2, and it consists of the union of all these closed intervals. Well, if we just continue this way, we're going to obtain a sequence of compact sets E sub n, such that their uh, E1 contains E2, and that contains E3, that contains E4, so on and so forth, right? So E0, the open inter sorry, the closed interval 0, 1, obviously contains E1. And then we're taking just more stuff away. So it also contains E2 and so on and so forth. So they're all uh, contained in the previous one. Also E2, uh, sorry, E sub n is a union of 2 to the n intervals, each of length 3 to the negative n. Right, so every time we're doubling the intervals, that's why it's 2 to the n. And the length 3 to the negative n because we are taking out the middle third of all those. So the set P equal, so the intersection of all these sets, like just continuing in that way, uh, taking out the middle third, the intersection of all those is known as the cancer set P. Cancer set is this. So eventually, uh, we're going to reduce to like tiny little points, no no more intervals. When I say eventually, that means when we take the process, when we go to infinity, right? So this is how it looks. There it is. So that will, that's how it looks. These segments get smaller and smaller. Eventually, we're just going to have little points. You can look up uh, on images anywhere like on Google, how the counter set looks. So this was E0, this was E1, this was E2, E3, E4, so on and so forth. So obviously you can see that E1 is contained in E0, this is contained in E1, E3 is contained in E2, so on and so forth. And this set is actually uncountable. Uh, something I didn't really include, but you can see in Principles of Analysis, uh, the book by Walter Rudin, you can see that uh, the details uh, that show, well, here clearly P is compact, right? The cancer set is compact, but also it's not empty, right? By the previous theorem, where the infinite intersection is not empty. 
you can see that uh, P contains no segment. There's a proof for that. Uh, also, the, this cancer set, P, is actually perfect. And in fact, P contain well, it is perfect. So it contains no isolated point. And one of the most interesting properties of this set is that it, it provides us with the example that we have an uncountable set with measure zero. And I know we haven't gotten over any measure or measure theory. We'll see that in chapter 11. But that is a really interesting property that we'll, I mean, we'll see later on. But now we can move on our definition of separated. So two subsets, A and B, of a metric space X are said to be separated if both the intersection A with the closure of B and the closure of A intersection with B are empty. Saying what? Well, if no point of A lies in the closure of B and no point of B lies in the closure of A, then they're separated. And a set E of X is said to be connected if E is not a union of two non-empty separated sets. So we're going to start with a theorem. Um, before I even mention this theorem, uh, just like kind of an example. 0, 1, the closed interval, and 0, 1, the open interval, are not separated. Wait a minute. Well, obviously not 0, 1. I did not mean 0, 1. I meant 1, 2. 1, 2 are not separated. Why is that? Well, because 1 is a limit point, right? 1 is a limit point of this open set. However, 0, 1, and 1, 2 are separated. Those two are separated. Right? Because, well, the closure of this set is 0, 1. That does not intersect with this set. Similarly, the closure of 1, 2, the open interval is 1, the closed interval 1, 2, that does not intersect with this interval. So these are separated. But we can now move on to our theorem, which we, we will go along with a real line since we are working with R1. Okay, so the theorem says a subset E of the real line R1 is connected if and only if it has the following property. So if X and Y are in E and X is less than Z less than Y, then Z must be in E. Okay, so there's a real line to help us draw this what's, to see what's going on. So first, uh, this is biconditional. So first we're gonna, if there exists X and Y in E and some Z inside the open interval x, y, such that z isn't an e, well then e is a union a, z, union with b, z, where a, z is uh, the intersection e with the, uh, the open set negative infinity to z, and b, z is the intersection of e with the open set z to infinity. Well, since x is in a z and y is in b z, a and b are non-empty, so we know that. And since a z is a subset of negative infinity to z, and b z is a subset of z to infinity, well, they're separated, right? Because these themselves are separated. The open intervals. Therefore, E is not connected. 
So here we prove one direction by using the contraposition. Right? So if if not this statements, then not this, not connected. Right, so that proves one direction by contraposition. Now the real line we're going to use with this next direction. So to prove the converse, suppose E is connected. Then there are not empty separated sets, AB, such that E is a union a, uh, AB. Right, so say E is in red. And we'll say this is A and this is B. We're going to pick an X and A. Actually, this might be confusing. So let's do this instead. Let's call this one A and this one B. Oh, but I mixed up the colors. So let's do this one A and this one B. Sorry about that. Okay, we're going to pick an X and A. So we're going to say this point is X. I want to let this point here be Y. And we're going to assume that X is less than Y. That's why I changed the sets so that X can be an Y and Sorry, x can be an a and it be less than y. We're going to define z to be the supremum of the intersection of a intersects with the closed interval x, z. So what does that mean? Well, let's draw in purple. This is the closed set, the closed interval x, y. And that set intersect with A is what? Is this here. All the way up to here. Right, so that's what this here is. But now the supremum is right here. Right, so this is Z. Well, by theorem 2.28, uh, sorry, I should have explicitly wrote that out. Uh, but theorem 2.28 said that if we have a, a non-empty set of real numbers that's bounded above, so I should write it E, non-empty set of real numbers, bounded above and we say y is a supremum of e then y must be in the closure of e so here by theorem 2.28 or in this case what's over here Z must be in the closure of A, right? And you can see here, A was open over here, but the closure would be the closed interval. So Z must be in the closure of A. Therefore, Z is not in B. Right, so, oh, and actually here, I did make a mistake. This shouldn't be closed. This should be open. And why should it be open? Because we are a. Uh, uh, well, it's right there. Uh, the reason it's open is because remember we're supposing E is not connected. If if we had the closed interval, then it would have been connected. So that's why it's an open one. I made a mistake there. But that's how we guarantee that Z is not in B. So in particular, 
y must be greater than z and z uh, can be greater than or equal to x if you mess around with this you can try that on your own but it follows that if z is not an a then it must be between x and y right and it'd be somewhere in this well in, in that little wedge there where they're both open so it's not an e and if z is an a well then z can't be in the closure of b as we just saw therefore there exists a z1 such that uh it's somewhere in here but not in b wait a minute what well then x is less than z1 less than y and z1 is now not an e so what happened here uh actually let me erase here so first we're going to be looking at to not get confused because this got confusing fast so watch so if z is not an a well, it follows that Z is not an E, right? That's the case where Z would be in this little wedge. But the other case was that if Z was an A, meaning Z, let's say, is right there, Z, well, then there exists a Z1 such that is wedged in there, Z1, such that it's greater than Z, as we can see here, and less than y and z1 is not in b because it's wedged in there so therefore z1 is not in e and this proves our little um, theorem uh, the other direction and this concludes our section for 2.4 our last section so next section we're going to be looking at sequences and series you probably are already familiar with it if you take an analysis on the real line you know what sequences are maybe even series i know you're, you're familiar with sequences and series from calculus calculus 2 and we'll be seeing uh, some properties of that in general metric spaces not just r1